majors will hate me for saying this shit, but I would love if somebody tries to buy a beat, you know, oh, here's the link. Oh, we want the stems. Oh, the stems are uh, available as an unlockable in the mint. So you minted it. I think up until this point, we've operated on this guy is that the label is going to handle things in a timely manner. And they're not, you know, they're kind of like, oh, yeah, we'll just let us put out the music and then we'll we'll kind of get around to handling the business. So now it's time for us to create just say no. Look at my NFT, buy the mint of the beat. You get the stems in there. You can download it, mix it, do whatever, release the song. And then as we get the contract worked out, we can get it out. And we'll just put that $1,500 as the price in there. Let's be honest, you're not going to find these videos anywhere else. Why? Because I make them. So it would really help me out if you subscribe. If you've already subscribed, what also really helps is if you like the video and leave a comment. It's hard in the era of clickbait videos on YouTube and negativity in the producer community. And I appreciate your support. Thank you so much. What, what was the time when you felt like giving up on music? Oh, all the time. <laughs> I mean, not necessarily giving up, but I mean, you know, shit gets tough. Even when, even when it's up, it's tough. You know, sometimes it even gets even more tough. So, uh, I think it's just about staying balanced. There's different times, different phases in my career. Like I've been doing music since before I was 16. So, I've gone through a lot of a lot of hills and valleys. It's like a roller coaster. It's just maintaining that balance in between and and just keeping it pushing. And I think in the picture I'd said you know sometimes not quitting is progress and I feel that way a lot of the times you know just keeping going that's that's the most important thing okay how did you convince yourself to keep going because as you said even when it's up like I'll have I'll have moments where it might just be one day and it feels devastating, even though the day before everything was was beautiful right you're on how, fire how, you can't miss the day before yeah right and then and then the next day it's still not even a that bad of a day but there's just something going on in my head where i'm like this isn't good what like what's gonna happen so how do you overcome those moments of self-doubt and just keep going because i agree with you that if you're stubborn enough to not give up you're automatically like five steps ahead of your peers who who might quit at any given moment well i just love it i just love it i'm so curious about it and i'm just a fan and so I just see so much opportunity and ability to be creative and different things. I didn't choose a regular job, so I don't have regular <laughs> regular issues. You know, I got different issues, still issues, but it's just uh, keeping everything in focus. So th th I had a whole bunch of questions that I didn't ask you the last time we had this conversation. So thank That's you right for coming back. Yeah. Um, I think also, I kinda, too, I put time into my craft. That's the main thing. I didn't say that. I put time into my craft, so I know what I'm doing is dope as fuck. And I feel like I'm bringing something to the marketplace. I'm bringing something to everything that I'm doing. Me and my squad are bringing something fresh every time to something. So I feel like we're doing a service by pushing ourselves so hard into uh, the sound design world like we were before with the Hollywood movie trailers and stuff, and then now in the NFT world. Um, I always feel like we're doing something different and something fresh and innovative and i don't think there's a lot of people doing that and so when i see stuff kind of stagnant i see an opportunity as opposed to being like oh this is what they're going radio is a lot of people are like oh that's just what's going i'm like oh so we can do anything if that's what's going we can just really go crazy and uh and really go wild so i mean it's an opportunity to be creative yeah i mean do you think a lot of people's negative outlooks have to do with their self-doubt because maybe they don't feel like they're pushing the envelope or maybe they, they don't feel like um uh, like they've escaped that that sort of stagnation um valley to use your term yeah um i don't know I know a lot of well, people. Well, did it happen to you? Too. Like, were you at a point where where you just kind of were doing the same thing over and over again? And you're like, this is this is affecting me in a negative way. I got to change that pattern. Um, not really, because we always the way we work is so experimental. We'll go through so many different styles and ways of making music and ways of making samples and ways of doing things, and then just not do it again. We might do something hard like almost every day for three months, and then never use that style again. I was thinking about doing a YouTube series of like forgotten techniques. Um, 
I was listening to this record Night Drive that I did with uh, John William, this flautist uh, that we work with. And there was the drum break. I thought it was a live drum break and it wasn't. It was one that I programmed. I didn't realize that. So I went back in on the mix and then I looked around the time. It was like seven other beats I did the same thing on. And I hadn't done that since. You know, this was two years ago. It was like this whole little technique I did and I just haven't used it since then. So I think it's always just like doing something experimental, doing something fun uh, with our crew everybody's always doing something different. Everybody's got like, Ricky always has a new pedal or something different. Everybody's got a new style or just something fresh. So there's always a constant inspiration. And then if one of us is down or busy or life is going on, one of the others or some of us will just pick up. I was just talking with Ricky about that. That's like one of our strengths. Uh, if one of us is just going through something personal or whatever. The other ones are able to hop back in and, and just keep it pushing. So let's say that you didn't have Five Points Bakery, right? Let's say you were mm -hmm. still solo. Because a, a lot of people making beats and producing records out there are, are doing it completely solo. And so oh, yeah. they find That was the first little... 10 years of my career. Yeah, so, so what would your advice be to the producers that are completely solo that don't necessarily have creatives around them to constantly push them and to reinvent them, their processes with? I would say find people online. Find people you can connect with, find people you can build with, find like minds. They're out there. The internet's so much easier to connect with people now. Like all the people that we're doing these NFTs with are from England and New Zealand and just all these different places. And so it's like go online, find find where people the stuff that you're interested in, find other people there and and just work with people. I wasn't really producing so much for the first ten years of my career. I was DJing and A and R and doing marketing. Um, but even with that, I was just finding people and music I wanted to be around. Like even when I first started uh, DJing and doing mixtapes, I would just go around Grand Hustle and they would just let me hang out. I would just be there because that was around the music that I wanted to hear, you know? So it's kind of like do the same thing. Put yourself in a place to where the things are happening that you want to be. Now you can do it digitally. Back then, back in my day, you had to be there, you know? Now it's like it's so easy to connect with people online. Uh, I was just working with this artist from California. Uh, she flew in to record me at Tree Sound, and I just put her up on Beat Stars. She was like, "I kind of do songs on other people's beats and this, that, and the other." I was like, "You know, you can go on Beat Stars and like lease a beat for like thirty dollars." She was like, "Really?" And I pulled up. She had wrapped me a song, and I went and pulled up a beat, and she rapped it to it, and she lost her mind. She was like, "It just blew her whole." You know, it's like it's a whole new world out here. You know, she can find her own sound just through working with Beat Stars or a License Lounge or whatever. You know, it's like whatever. It's like you can connect in ways you never could before. I remember looking for beats when I was just a and projects before I was producing. And it was hard to find producers who had equipment and who stuff sounded yeah. good and who had some originality and who had taste. Now it's like a lot of beats are really dope. Now they're just looking for the context of the right artist. Yeah, I mean, my whole, uh, my whole, my, my own, my own Five Points Bakery, which is Vintage Vandals, um, you know, that's beat stars you know we connected through two of them are, are from my city but um it wouldn't have happened without connecting online and and that's part of our our workflow so i definitely agree with that that's dope um that's let, let's dope. talk let's talk big placements um because i i had been meaning to ask you this it just we just ran out of time the last time sleepy brown superfly that was a big placement um, how did you get that song placed in the Superfly film? Uh, my homie DJ Funky was, he's worked with Future a lot. He was one of the first champions of his music. When Future became executive producer of the Superfly reboot soundtrack, he reached out to him and Funky reached out to us. He was like, yo, we need some music. And so we went over, I think we did a couple, a couple rough ideas and then went over to his house and Sleepy came over there and we played a couple. And I think one of the first ones we played was that idea and it didn't even have drums on it and sleepy was like yo put some drums on i'll write to it and i worked hard on it <laughs> we all worked hard on it for like two months straight solid and then didn't hear anything back and like last minute ended up getting picked so that it wasn't even like a guarantee we just had to believe that it was going to get placed and then last minute uh big boy was actually the one who pushed it through apparently somebody was like uh somebody told him to album needed more dynamics and he was like yo you got to use this song and they ended up using it as a first song so that was super dope so 
how did you form the relationship with, with DJ Funky that led up to this? And how long in the making was that, that relationship? Yeah, since I was like 17. Since I was like 16, 17, I've been bringing clients to him to play their records in the club. He has a DJ crew called Coalition DJs, too. And it's pretty much all the top DJs in the strip clubs in Atlanta and the mixtape circuit. Um, and so I've just been working with him for the longest, like the longest, the longest. And so anytime there's anything like live music or anything like that, he kind of hit me up and be like, yo, I need, you know, I need something special. So yeah, that was that's a long relationship, and that just comes from me just always wanting to bring something to the table. I never just want to like hang around and be a hanger on. I want to be like, oh yeah, I got this client. You know, this person wants to get their record played. You're in the club. Let me connect. I've always just connected people, um, and so from that, a lot of stuff like just being cool with DJ Funky. We've had a relationship for over 15 years now. Yeah, I was talking about this with with Dame earlier. Uh, the fact that I'm on BeatStars right now and succeeding on the platform is because of a, re of a relationship I started with Mike Trampy 11 years ago. I think it was 11 years ago. And I think a lot of people are just so impatient that, because I, I posted about it, I tweeted about it, about how long it took me. You know, 11 years is a long time for some people. Oh, yeah. For me, it's worth it because you know I'm. I'm what? <laughs> how amazing is life when you're making music for a living? And you know that's that's that was my dream for a long time. So the fact that it took me 11 years is nothing. But I think in a lot of people's minds, waiting that long and and fostering and nurturing relationships that don't immediately pay off just seems like like just too much, and they don't want to deal with it. Yeah, I think you got to be in it for the right reasons. I think if you're in it for like a quick money grab, there's probably better ways to make money. Better ways to make quick money. Um, but I just love music. I'd be doing it even if I had to do it for free. And I'd be putting in the same amount of effort probably, keeping it real, just because I love it. Like, we didn't get paid up front to do the super flat track. We just went crazy on that shit, you know? We went crazy on shit. Like, they said, yeah, we're guaranteed using it. And just down to the last minute, they actually use it. So it's like... I'm always going to put that effort in. We're always going to put that same effort in. I think if you have that attitude, good things will happen. And it's just going to take time. It's not going to happen when you want it to happen. We also see a lot of, some people tweet, you know, dedicate yourself a whole year to something or a whole, a whole summer. Like, man, I'm dedicated a whole, <laughs> a whole 20 years, you know, a whole 20 something. It's a long time, you know. Yeah, I think I think if you dedicate your, your yourself to something in a year, and after that year, if you're not hooked on it, then and, and you feel like you could st still give up at that point, maybe it's not the right thing. Right. Like I did music, DJing, and R and doing marketing for eleven years before I started producing, and that's I'm gonna take that year just to produce, and then I've stayed on it since then. You know. Yeah, because you were hooked, you fell in love with it, but if you hadn't, it just it wouldn't have been the right thing for you. Clear, obviously was a and then it's also it's healthy to quit too it's healthy mm -hmm. to quit there's some people who aren't built for high stress situations like I'm cool in recording situations and different things because I don't get stressed out by certain things or I don't um, I know how to handle certain situations some people don't some people aren't people 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 and this is a people business so it's cool if, you know but don't put yourself in a position to where you have to deal with people and you're stressing yourself out you don't you know you're not doing that, right? Yeah, I don't know. I guess I, I don't make any sense. Um, so I was looking at your, your <laughs> title not, playlist, not. which, which yeah, no, clearly, um, I'm not offended. I, I'm yeah. looking at your title playlist, which I should have done a while ago. Yeah, your your discography is crazy. Okay, so just a couple standout titles. Extravagant by Lil Durk and Nicki Minaj. Right yep. by Rich the Kid. Drip by uh, Guap Dad 4000. Drip on You. By Guap Dad 4000, Natural High by Freddie Gibbs, Walk by Young and May. That's just a couple of them, um, and I know that there are stories behind each of these tracks. Which, which one of these placements has the craziest backstory? Um, all of those. Well, I'll say the 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 coolest one was just the Rich the Kid one. That was me and DJ Spins, and that it, it was the coolest just because it was the quickest. 
he just happened to have his computer up when I was dropping his camera off. I'd borrowed his camera for something. And I dropped it off and he had his computer up and I was like, yo, let's get a jam in real quick. And he was like, for real? I was like, yeah, why not? And so he pulled up a sound and I played just real simple keys. He did some drums and put a piano and I didn't even know he sent it to Rich the Kid. He didn't send it to me until it was already like a 500,000 views. I was like, oh, okay, this is dope. But it was cool because it just happened and it just came from, I always have this attitude if we have just any amount of time, let's get a quick jam in. Let's just make something real quick, whether anywhere, any place we're at. Like, you know, we got 10 minutes, let's make a quick joint. And uh, that's just a testament to that. That song would have never happened if it wasn't just for saying, yeah, let's just, let's just cook up real quick. Didn't have time, didn't, didn't have a long, um, a long, yeah, didn't have a lot of time, but just, just made it real quick and shit, it just happened. It's funny because sometimes you feel like the intention, if you put the right intention into it or the right, if you work so hard on it that people will feel it. And sometimes the shit you work the hardest on, people will feel the least. <laughs> you had to massage it too much or it's not. Yeah. The vibe just wasn't right. That's why you spend so much time on it. You're like, oh, I spent 12 hours on this beat. It's like, maybe it wasn't the right vibe because you could spend 10 minutes on one and that'd be the vibe. Or you could spend, you know, two months on the Superfly record and that'd be the right amount of time. Um, but it's just interesting knowing the amount of time doesn't always equal the outcome. So I thought that was like the most surprising. But all of them are cool. A lot of those are from the samples that we send out to producers and all that's networking online. All that's me hitting up DMs, being fans of people, being like, yo, I love your shit. Can I send you some some uh, samples? And the producers being like, yo, yeah. And they'll connect them. Like, uh, was it the Jadena record? We did that. We sent that sample to Lil C. He's working with Mike and Keys. They do the beat together. And now we got Jadena's first single from his last album. So that was pretty dope. How did the, the Young and May track come together? A similar thing. We were working with uh, this group of producers called One Mind. They did Unforgettable for French Montana. They actually really were the first ones that got us into doing samples because when they started coming to Atlanta, they would sit in the back of the room like, yo, give us some music. This was around the time Pierre was around and all that. They would just sit in the back and be like, yo, give us some music. And so we would just start giving them, I'd mute the drums out of a beat or just start giving them music and they would start doing drums. So they were the first producers we really started doing that with, like doing samples with. Um, and they sent some beats to Young and May, and she did that joint. Came out super hard. But it's always cool because I have my network, these producers have their network, and then it's like sometimes I'll send off the beat we do together, or sometimes the producer does. So it's just cool. It's like it's doubling your network as soon as you, you do it. Yeah. that's. that's I would ideally rather true. be in the studio with somebody, but we don't have that. The, the option so this is literally like the second best is like well if we can't be there here's some vibes yeah how how has COVID affected your process I'm sure it has because you're always not always but often one of the in-person type of, of music makers yeah it's it stopped as far as just like going out not really with DJing I really stopped taking DJ gigs and stuff like that so not really hearing music out that's been a difference I'm always used to being out and vibing with the music um, but other than that we've pretty much a lot of the stuff we do has been established online working with different artists and um different producers like i'm saying with the sample packs and the nfts all that's online uh so we kind of adapted it to where we can do most of the hustling from the house all right another another thing i was going to ask the last time but didn't get a chance i didn't actually know you were a part of the snow on the bluff film and you you scored the the soundtrack oh yeah so we did the trailer, we scored the trailer, and then we, um, yeah, we scored the trailer, and then, um, what else? We scored, there's actually a couple songs in there. Kurt Snow actually came through, and we produced a couple songs for him, and they used some in the movie, and then on uh, one of the official mixtapes that came out, they didn't drop, like, an actual soundtrack, but that version that came out. It was really dope. That's another thing of just... Ricky keeps his ear to the streets too. And he heard that they were working on a movie. It was just filmed. And Ricky just reached out to Kurt. And Kurt was like, yo, we need some music. And he sent us the trailer. It had like an outcast beat on it. Then we put a new track. Like we wrote to it and did something new. And we didn't know. We put it out. We knew people liked it. But we didn't know until like maybe a couple, like maybe two months ago, Kurt and Ricky were talking. 
and uh, Kurt was like, "Yo, y'all don't know how much that music meant to the trailer. Like, if we didn't, if we didn't have y'all do that, we don't. He didn't know what would happen with the movie. That's what he said. So it's dope. You never know how you can impact things, and that's like a cultural, like a it's like a hood classic here. People love that shit, and it's dope. So it was nice to be a part of something like that. That's like a phenomenon in its own little way, you know. Yeah. Um, what was that process like? actually scoring a film i mean compared to making beats for songs well this is kind of like the blair witch style like the the way of the movie so it's not like a traditional score so it's like some songs that kind of play randomly throughout it and like i said we scored the trailer um the movie trailer but it's a lot of this stuff i keep talking about nfts that's just what we're doing now a lot of this stuff with that is more scoring related and really different than just purely composing beats like that definitely calls for a whole different kind of skill set you can adapt being a producer to that but writing music it's almost kind of like writing for a video game kind of have you done that work on video games no but we're speaking into existence right now okay. we are we'll definitely do some we'll do some shit i'm sure doing these nfts is definitely going to lead to it because we're doing all types of stuff I saw some guy trying to clown. Oh, one of the last pieces we sold, he was like, sounds like Sony PlayStation startup music. I was like, that's pretty dope. You know, I like that. It's not a bad thing to sound like. Yeah, that's not an insult. Because it's someone, really not. He was someone like, got paid a lot like, of money I, I, for that. I, that. I like, I like the Sony PlayStation startup music, you know? Yeah, it's, it's it's hilarious. Some of the insults are like, it sounds like Justin Bieber's next hit. Like, oh, wow, really? That's a <laughs> that's not an insult. Anyway, um, what was I going to say? Uh... In in terms of how business gets handled, how does film scoring compare to more traditional placements? As far as knowing the bluff, that was an independent film, so that was probably handled separately than anything else we get filmed. I mean, anything else we get handled. The sound design that we did for Hollywood movie trailers, that was different too because we worked with a sound design house, a movie trailer house, and they serviced the sounds to different... Um, I guess trailer houses. There's a sound design company that services trailer houses because there's companies that just do movie trailers. And so they send them the sounds. We sold them the sounds and then they distribute the sounds. Still waiting on the first like complete score. We've done like a lot of like smaller things. Like we scored some stuff for Ubisoft. We did a commercial for them. Uh, so we're building up to the full feature film. So let's, let's get into, um, NFT territory. Tell me about this Nocturne Skies project you recently worked on. Yeah, that's a really dope collaboration. It's our first collection with Nate in the Wild. He's a real dope uh, landscape photographer and videographer. Uh, he went and shot the Aurora Borealis and he did like a bunch of real dope time lapses and sent them to us and we scored them. Um, and we're in the process of releasing that as a collection. We put it out, but then it's, it's interesting just experiment right now with the different marketplaces and stuff. Some allow for certain terms and availability and drop drop release uh, terms, and then others don't. So we're kind of re recalculating uh, the release of that until we can get a, a better proper release. But uh, the other stuff we released up until that, I think we've sold like 13 or 14 of our releases, the one of one mints. And so... Actually, I think like five of those were a drum kit. We dropped a, a hundred of a hundred drum kit, meaning there's only a hundred being sold. I think there's like 95 of those left. Um, and then the rest were one-on-one -on -one pieces to where we connected with people online, different videographers, 3D motion graphic designers from around the world. It's really dope. It's really dope. It's a whole new world. It's like, and it's all happening on Twitter. It's like this 24-hour nonstop uh, kind of like art club or something and everybody's just posting up their work it's like now is the time for creators to kind of get back their power and just control their own destiny there's no middleman there's no um, there's no gatekeepers to any of it there's nobody they have to wait as long as you're going to hustle and get your name out there network do all these things do all the things you're doing and anything else you could have a good chance of succeeding and I think that's really dope. And then with the blockchain, with, with the ability to mint things, you're saying, I created this thing. So I think that's going to cut down on a lot of the copyright infringement bullshit. 
because you're going to say, hey, I minted this on this day. If you didn't mint it, uh, it hey, you know, it's not. As soon as you mint something, that means that was when it was created. So I think that's just going to cut down on a lot of the bullshit of people saying, well, I made this before. It's like, you made it, mint it, put it out. It's kind of like what put is, up or shut up thing. What is the minting process involved? So the minting process is when you actually place something onto the blockchain. So the NFT thing is non-fungible token, but it just means there's no one-to-one -one correlation. So if I give you a dollar, you can give me a different dollar in this for the same amount. If I give you one of my NFTs, there's no core, there's no correlation to the dollar amount. There's no like it equals four or whatever. It's just so anyway, so the minting process is basically an NFT is like a journal entry onto the blockchain, but it's a public ledger, so everybody can see it and you can't edit it. Nobody can edit it. So they have these different things called uh unlockables and different things, different links you can add to it. So you can have essentially a, a container of data or whatever you want, a video or anything else. Some people put physical things in there. Um, it can be anything. How do you as far put as a the physical process, thing in there? Like, um, you can put it as an unlockable and have it available so when somebody buys it, you ship it to that person. So I've seen people And then all their like information that. is in there? Like, yeah. yeah, when somebody buys it, they can include the shipping information and you can work it out from there. I haven't done any physical releases yet, so I'm not the expert to talk to on that, but I've seen people do shoes, and all different kind of things. But as far as the minting process, say I create, somebody creates the visual, we create the music, and then I find a marketplace like Foundation or OpenSea, and I go on there and I upload it, and I click Mint. Minting is actually like placing it on the blockchain, putting that journal entry into the, the blockchain journal. Um, and you have to pay like an Ethereum gas fee for it, because all this is dealt with in Ethereum cryptocurrency. And once that's done, then it goes up for sale. And so how much is that fee usually? It depends on the amount of traffic on the network and it depends on if the network is doing well or not. I think if Ethereum like the money, like the price of it is up, I think the gas is down. But if the price of it's down, then the gas is up. I think that's how it works. Um so usually sometimes it's around like sixty dollars to a hundred dollars to mint something. And then OpenSea is doing this thing now to where you can pay a one time one hundred dollar fee. And all the mints are essentially free after that. You're minting on the same collection. So that's that's something that we we're starting to experiment with. Um, but it's interesting. There's there's a lot of different ways. But it's just basically a way for creators to sell art online. Kind of like how these auction houses are. You can set a lot of these uh, as auctions. Like Foundation, I sold a piece yesterday with this photographer from New Zealand named Caleb Johnston. And it was like a 3D motion piece. And... Basically, as soon as somebody met, you set like a minimum bid, it was like 0.75 Ethereum. As soon as somebody put that minimum bid in, it triggers a 24-hour auction. And people can bid against each other for that 24 hours. Different websites have different rules and different things. You can put just a buy now price if you just want to just say, hey, like on our drum kits, there's a buy now price of 0.25 Ethereum. You pay that, you could just buy it right there. There's no auction or anything like that. So it just depends. And then you could release them in two different ways, either a one of one saying this exists as a one time thing or like a collection. And it's like additions. Like I got a red one, I got a blue one, or I got a chopped and screwed one, I got a regular one. Just kind of however you want to do it. Well, we have questions a lot coming in. Bro. I literally watched the space for eight months before I jumped into it just to study it and understand it. And so this past month and a half has been experimenting with releases. And we have to add some really good success because there's a lot of dope people who really aren't selling. Their art isn't selling right now for whatever reason, you know? So we're blessed mm -hmm. to have been able to sell, you know, over 10, 10 pieces already. Um, but it's a lot to take in. And so one thing that I'm trying to do now is to work on different uh, resources and things to point people in the right direction, almost uh, a step-by-step -step like primer to it because a lot of people hit me up and I'll have this one video from this guy DCL blogger that I'll send and I'm like this is what an NFT is and that's the basic of that but then it's like all right kind of breaking it out even more so I'm kind of working on some resources for people to kind of point them in the right direction and and help people out because this is the way for all of us to get our power back I think a lot of people and a lot of creative people are trapped in client work for corporations and different people and this is the way to get out of that you can still do your client work but just split it up and have on um, your off time, do your own art. Maybe that gets more popular and you start doing your client work on 
the time on the time you were doing your hobby work on. I see a lot of people who uh, this one guy who did the John Wick trailer, the not the trailer but the movie poster. He dropped a couple NFCs and that shit's going crazy. A couple collections, so it's like now he can do the the client work whenever he wants. He doesn't. I don't know if he was dependent on, but he don't have to. It's like it's just a way to to get our freedom back. And it's dope. Honestly, I'm so inspired to just be able to create art 24 seven. Like there's been times where I'm so dead tired and I'm, it's like six o'clock and I'm about to go to sleep and I'm like, don't want to go to sleep or just hit up a couple of people and see if they've got some video they want to send me. And there's been plenty of times like Caleb, the last piece we sold, not this, the most recent one, but the second one we sold three so far together. I just happened to be up at seven o'clock and I was just about to go to sleep. And he, I think I tweeted something. He sent me a link. He's like, yo, you want to score this? And I, I did it like super quick. You know, but just because I was up, if I was asleep, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have done it. So a lot of it's like opportunity, um, but it's dope to be able to create art and put it out and have people be like, oh, this is a neat thing. Because a lot of times we feel like we're creating in like this, this endless black hole, <laughs> you know, like this, this vacuum of like, I'm putting my art out there and I'm not getting the feedback of like, what do y'all think? I like it. My people like it. You know, like we think it's dope and then you'll have some success like placements and different things, but to a certain sense, you just feel like you're existing in a vacuum sometimes as a creative, um, just the way things are kind of set up now. So with this, like putting it out, the community is so supportive. It just feels like a, a fresh, a fresh place to create art. And music is art as part of the entertainment business, but it's also just art. Okay, I have a lot of questions, but Cameron Prince wants to know what's the longest you've had to wait for a sale. Um. An NFT? Most of them sell within a couple of days. Ours have. Now, this is because I've done a lot of networking. I've hit up, like, I studied this. I've studied, like I said, for eight months just to find out who are the dope people. And then even then, I hit up so many people. And the people that hit me back were the people that hit me back. And I just went hard for those people that hit me back. Um, but there's, I think I've, I have, like, maybe one piece that hasn't sold yet. And it's been up there probably about a month now, maybe. Um but most of them actually go pretty quick. And a lot of that depends on like pricing and different things. Like the Nocturne Skies hasn't sold yet, but we priced that starting at 10 Ethereum. We weren't trying to do like the regular smaller sales on that. We're trying to establish these collections as something different. And so, is that a one of one? Yeah, it is. Yeah. And there's five pieces in the collection. So that was going to be the first piece of dropping it. Didn't get the response. And that was only a three day time. Again, I think if maybe we would have set a two week auction on it, maybe we would have got a different response. It's it's really just experimenting. There's no way to mess up because it's so new. Like I could say, Oh, we fucked up, but it's new and selling it for selling one of those pieces for under one Ethereum would be fucking up to me. That would be a fuck up. So I'd rather just like, all right, let me just step back and recalibrate that release. Because we've got two short films. We've got um we've got two short films and we've got like three oh, really like a lot of pieces coming. We got a lot of stuff coming out, so kind of just want to take my time on that one. The collections are, are just viewed as more special, uh, and especially this being our first one, I just want to do it right because it's really dope. That shit's so hard. And he was out there like filming some of that shit for like some of those time lapses are like seventeen hours in the middle of fucking mm -hmm. nowhere. Yeah. Do you know how much uh, one Ethereum is is worth right now or valued at? Mm hmm. We can look it up real quick. It fluctuates between like fourteen hundred and eighteen hundred. Um, okay, but I mean that's a good that's a good reference point. I just we we have yeah. ten minutes left, and I have a lot of questions. And I would say two thousand right now. To the damn. All right. Mm -hmm. So so you were selling that collection for around eighteen twenty thousand. Well, the first piece was start. The first bid was starting at ten Ethereum. Yeah, and it was going to scale up from there. Like the first piece ten. The next one was probably going to be like fifteen, and then kind of up from there. Got it. Um, so Cloud9 Music wants to know which website or service you would recommend for a producer who's who's wanting to make uh, their beats into NFTs. So there's a lot of new marketplaces. Like, I think it's... Um, uh, I'm going to have to send some links. There's a couple. It's called Odd something. All the odd... I forget what it is. Audius. Maybe it's Audius. I know that's a a strictly music platform. They got another one called 
uh, something collective. There's a couple uh, marketplaces. I'll have to send you some links on this and look it up. But there's a couple that are just specifically for music. And you can probably look up music NFTs. And technically, you can sell music NFTs. I've seen people sell songs on OpenSea. OpenSea is the biggest marketplace. Anybody can sign up. That's well, probably I'd recommend everybody sign up. And yeah, just put you one on there. Start from there and then look for different ones as you get more more into it. But OpenSea is a great place to start. That's a, that's probably the biggest marketplace right now for, for NFTs. Okay. So here's a big question about um, NFTs. When you sell an NFT... Are you because it's it's single owner usually if you're doing a one on one or one of one sorry are you selling your copyrights are there situations in which you don't actually sell your copyrights to, to that piece I think of all art? this is now just being figured out honestly honestly because I've seen some people you know I see them selling the Top Shot dunk somebody has to actually own that footage. So how the NFT is getting sold? Maybe it's the person that owns the footage is selling it. I don't. I don't know. I'm not too into. It. I know the Top Shot is even bigger than music and artists right now in the NFT world. Um, that's what I'm. That's what I'm not sure of as far as the intellectual property. I know you get royalties on what you sell. So on different marketplaces, you can say like Rarible. I think you can set up thirty percent. Um, and so I think on our drum kit we put ten percent. So every time if somebody resells a drum kit. We get 10% of that. On the one-on-ones, we place it a little bit higher, like 20%. And so you'll get those residuals forever. And all that's in the blockchain and all set up in the system. So you never have to worry about the money not being sent to you or anything. In perpetuity, you'll get that. This is the first time in the history. You don't have to audit the company. I know you're looking at me like, really? This is intriguing. Yeah. Royalties that you don't have to actually, like, no, for real. Like, you can put whatever your royalties amount. And if somebody sells a piece, say, your value goes up in six months and all your pieces are going for a hundred thousand. Now this piece you sold for one, you know, 1000. Now that goes for, for a uh, hundred thousand. You participate in that sale. If you set a 10% royalty, you're getting that thousand dollars, you know, $10,000 or whatever that is of that in perpetuity so, forever. So do you think moving forward? Cause Bufo is talking a lot about uh, his critiques of Ethereum gas fees. Um, do you think moving forward, once this becomes a little more popular, there will be more options and, and the prices? Well, they've got Ethereum be- 2 coming. That's supposed to be like the updated latest greatest with like less carbon emissions and um, less gas fees. And I know there's marketplaces coming up right now that are doing stuff to like like OpenSea. If you pay the 100 time, $100 collection fee, you're not paying the regular gas fees. Um, I think you have to pay one gas fee when it gets sold. I believe so. And usually the buyer will pay for that. Um, I like the gas fee as a barrier to entry. I do. It's like, do you believe in your art? Hell yeah, fucking myth that shit and put it out there. You know, I feel like it, it makes you put skin in the game. It makes you care. Like when I had to used to have to press up the CDs and go hand them to people and drive around. You know, I had to get out there and fucking do the thing, you know? I, I don't think it's a bad thing. Now, I'm actually working on things to help artists who can't afford to pay gas fees and stuff um do that but i i don't see it as a bad thing sometimes it can get exorbitant and that is a problem but ethereum 2 2 is coming so hopefully that'll that'll solve both those problems how does it work because you're doing so many collaborations on nfts how does that work with the blockchain is that a simple process is it simpler than the traditional right now it's the right now it's the trust system because you can see that you can see it online if it sells. You can always go to that link of the piece of where it is and see, oh, somebody just bought it. You know, somebody else just bought it. Right now, some collabs will put on our pages. Some collabs, they'll put on their pages. And then when it sells or resells, they'll just hit us up and then send it to our wallet. I'm working on something right now to where collaborators can split that shit immediately because it doesn't make any sense why people can't do that. I just know they didn't understand it. And that hasn't been a way people were had to use it up until this point. But now it's becoming necessary. So I'm trying to figure out some things now to where creators can immediately get split royalties. And that doesn't even have to be that. That part of it doesn't have to be there. But again, I think because of the barrier of entry of gas fees, nobody's fucking around. So I haven't had one person try to jerk me. I haven't sold one piece and me not send the money or they not send the money. It's very much like everybody is dead ass serious about doing this shit. Because like, if you're doing it, you got to spend time on it. 
I don't want people to think you could just jump into it and be successful. Maybe you can if you already had something successful going on and you're like already popping. Um, but you're going to have to work for it. But the thing is, again, just like working for your career, 10 years working for yourself. Now you got a career for yourself as opposed to investing time into somebody else's company or you can learn in those times. But, you know. You invest in yourself, you're not going to grow. Okay, this, this brings up a good point for me then, because we're talking about barrier of entry. We're talking about um, tech, technology and, and cutting edge, and, and it's kind of, it seems like a lot of it is, is just falling into place now, and, and we're going to see a lot of changes and a lot of, um, I guess, a lot more refinement of this whole thing, this whole NFT process. Who is buying NFTs right now? So right now, right now, the main buyers are collectors who fucking ran it up in Bitcoin and Ethereum, got in early, bought like Bitcoin for 50 cents a share, thousands, hundreds of thousands of shares, and now it's a 60K a share. They got ridiculous money. Um, you got those. And then you also have artists. I bought two pieces. I spent like two grand in pieces artists supporting artists that's a big thing people get people a lot of artists buy, get money and immediately buy other art that's a beautiful thing I haven't really seen that in a lot of other ways you don't really see like anybody start getting show money like oh i'm gonna start buying verses or i'm gonna patron your your art like you don't see that with this artists are supporting other artists a lot of people that have bought stuff from us just want to see us win a lot of people so that's that's really dope I don't know where yeah, how do you think that's going to evolve <laughs> over over the next couple of years? It is everything. It's so new. Like it's so new. Like over the next year, it's going to go crazy. But really, the next ten years is going to be interesting to see where it evolves. I would like to see. You know, we we're talking about how to possibly run beat contracts through there. I majors will hate me for saying this shit, but I would love if somebody tries to buy beat. I meant that shit, and say. You got to pay the mint, you know. Oh, here's the link. Oh, we want the stems. Oh, the stems are uh, available as an unlockable in the mint. So you minted it. That creates everything. It says this is the one of one. Now you put the stems in there as an unlockable. Oh, we want the stems. Oh, yeah, you can buy it. It's, what, 1500 2500 whatever your, your price is. You could just set it as a buy now price. When they pay that, then they get the stems. <clears throat> I think up until this point, it's been under the under this guise, we've operated on this guise that the label is going to handle things in a timely manner. And they're not, you know, they're kind of like, oh yeah, well just let us put out the music and then we'll, we'll kind of get around to handling the business. So now it's time for us to creators to say, no, look at my NFT, buy the mint of the beat. You get the stems in there. You can download it, mix it, do whatever, release the song. And then as we get the contract worked out, we can get it out and we'll just put that $1,500 as the price in there, you know, or whatever it is, you know, we'll put that as the price in there. Um, and we'll work out the contract as it comes whenever you want to get that done we'll, we'll work out the contract you know that way we're not stressed out and being like fuck why are we waiting 6, 9, 12, 2 years two months you know for all this for the money and it's not like these are complex contracts where we're doing like a corporate merger it's a song deal for one song and it's usually not that difficult yeah. so I think if we just say hey Here's the mint. Here's the stems. Oh, we got to get a mix. Yeah, we'll just pay for it. You have the money. You know, buy it. And they buy it. Then we can work out the contract from there. You got the stems. We can work out the rest from there. We'll put the price in there. They're not going to like it, but do we like where, where it is right now? Fuck no. Fuck no. And we've just been taking it. And I think now the NFTs are a way for us to readjust and recalibrate how we value ourselves, how we conduct business. And just the lever, the way we view leverage in everything. Because right now, the labels up until this point have had all the leverage in the history of all history. The labels have had all the leverage. And now with artists being able to drop NFTs and do all this, the artists are about to get all the power back. The producers, we're about to get the power back. Now for producer, now this is a whole new world to where if a producer, say they don't really talk to people well and don't really want to do, they love making beats, but they don't really want to do songs. Now they can connect with a videographer from thailand and do an nft and put that shit out and maybe people are fuck with that and if they don't try another one and now i'm networking finding just like i was trying to find artists and trying to find producers trying to find artists to give our beats and trying to find producers to give our samples now i'm finding motion graphic designers and videographers to score their you know I'm like, what do you got 
<laughs> what do you have? What kind of video do you have? Let's score it. Let's drop that shit. Like, let's make something really dope. Let's make it fresh. Let's make it interesting. Let's put it out. Let's keep going. Okay, so last question because we've already ran mm -hmm. over, but this is a fascinating conversation, and I, and Illmind is coming on in in a couple weeks. Um, nice. So we're definitely going to continue this talk. Yeah. So any, yeah, anyone yeah. in here that it's wants to ask to him talk. questions, yeah, exactly, because you and him are early adapters, and there aren't too many other producers that I can name that are, that are um, paying attention to this stuff. So. Last question: What is new for you in Five Points Bakery in in twenty twenty one coming up? NF motherfucking tees, NFTs. It's the it's it's the now and it's the future, and it's why I really haven't slept the past two months. I really haven't. It's so awesome to be able to just create and make really awesome, different, random shit, putting our weirdest beats against the dopest visuals, and it being cool, and not having a middleman, bro. Come on, I know you feel me. Not having the middleman be like. We need a song for this trailer that's like Eminem's Lose Yourself. Fuck that shit, bro. License Eminem's Lose Yourself. Don't ask me for that shit, you know? It's like, you get paid a job to ask for the most popular mu movie trailer song ever. They're actually paying you for this, you know? And it's like, the notes I get back from our collaborators are dope. It's like one little tweak or one little thing to where a lot of these middlemen are like, can you do something more mainstream? Can you give me something more trap? Can you give me something that kills the whole vibe because they're worried about losing their job? my art is not getting fucked up by somebody not worried about losing their job anymore come on what is the impact of that about to be max like compound that with people being able to connect around the world real time and create art together and release it and like everything be able to be the business wise be kept up with it's a public ledger this is about to be the dopest time of creating art I think of all time for fucking sure. How could it not be? Do you see some of the stuff people are doing with motion graphics? What people are doing with music now? Like, shit's about to go crazy. And like the stuff I see every day, my feed is just like the dopest art I've ever seen. Every day, I'm just like, wow, people are really just waking up making the illest shit. And it, it, there's something for everybody. You don't have to do one thing. There's no number one spot we're trying to fight for for radio or 12 spots on a playboy cardio album that everybody's trying to fight for or th there gets such this negative energy because everybody's fighting for these certain selected amount of slots there's not that in the nft world so all the people there's only a couple of people doing music but everybody's cool all the graphic designers are cool there's no need to be like catty or snippy or all the stuff you're saying like all the hater shit it's like if you're a hater in that world you're not gonna make it because nobody's gonna want to fuck with you they just want good energy we've dealt with negative energy from every other aspect of our regular work like we're not gonna bring that shit here you know well once again i appreciate your time um sh shout out shout out your social media so everyone can follow you yeah at dj burn one dj b u r n o n e Sorry, I think I passed my you know quota. I looked at the comments last time. They smashed me for my note, my you know. I was going to get a shirt yeah. that said you know and not say nothing. 